Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Josh Owen. I'm the Massimo and Lela Vignelli Distinguished Professor of Design and Director of the Vignelli Center for Design Studies. Delighted to welcome you to our first public event of 2021. Tonight, we host the fourth lecture of this academic year's Vignelli Design Conversations series presented by Design Milk and made possible in part by the generosity of RIT alumnus Chris Bailey and Bailey Brand Consulting. Rochester Institute of Technology's Vignelli Center for Design Studies is an international hub for education, research, collaboration, and advocacy, which expands the scope of the programs in the College of Art and Design School of Design. The facility houses the archive of renowned designers Lella and Massimo Vignelli, whose works are icons of international design. The center and archives sit within RIT's College of Art and Design, which was built on the traditional territory of the Onondaga, or people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as Seneca people, keepers of the Western door. They are one of the six sovereign nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We honor the land on which RIT was built and recognize the unique relationship that the indigenous stewards have with this land. That relationship is the core of their traditions, cultures, and histories. We recognize the history of genocide, colonization, and assimilation of indigenous people that took place on this land. Mindful of these, these histories, we work towards understanding, acknowledging, and reconciling. As stewards of history and content, we must acknowledge and seek to learn from our context, bad and good, ugly and beautiful. This applies to the Vignelli Center as with any archive. The Vignellis taught us that design is a systematic framework for solving the world's most intractable problems. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that while we as humans are adaptable, our societies and systems have major flaws. We're at a point when we need to have difficult discussions and work to create a new balance in the world. In this, design must play a critical role. As the new director, I aim to make the Vignelli Center even more accessible and applicable by bringing in exciting guest contributors from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds who are using design in innovative ways. The Vignelli's design is one philosophy leaves us with a universal message that design is a lens through which we can envision a more inclusive tomorrow. Before introducing our fourth guest of this year's lecture series, I'd like to take a few moments to set the stage. Out of respect for our presenter, participants will be muted for the duration of the event, but we do encourage you to enter questions you have for our presenter using the Q&A feature, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible during our closing Q&A segment. Tonight's event will also be live captioned. Thank you, Cindy Thompson, for providing these services which can be accessed by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. Thanks also to Jason Rivera, who will be our sign language interpreter tonight. It is a rare pleasure to introduce someone as accomplished and connected to the legacy we represent in the Vignelli Center as our guest tonight. Few individuals as young as our guests have taken the lessons offered by Lella and Massimo Vignelli and applied them so astutely and so generously in direct service of society. When I was first introduced to Felipe by our mutual friend and former Vignelli Design Conversation speaker, Gary Hustwit, with whom Felipe collaborated on a short film, I was delighted to learn that he had quietly visited us in the Vignelli Center a number of years ago, stopping to pose for a picture outside the building with his young son, as if both to record and to pass on the importance of this place and what it represents. While Felipe managed to slip in and out of the center stealthily unnoticed on that visit by those of us who were active here at the time, he has evaded our notice no longer. Felipe Memoria is a designer and founding partner at Work and Co a global product design and development agency with 400 people across offices in the US, South America, and Europe. He leads the company's unique vision for building successful products and services using lean teams of hands-on senior talent who work in tight collaboration with its clients. 
Felipe is overseeing the design of several of Work & Co launches, including work for Virgin America, YouTube, Eurosport, Acorns, MailChimp, Embraer, Expa, and the MTA. Previously, he was partner global head of UX at Huge, where he designed some of the company's most celebrated products, including CNN.com, HBO Go, and TED Talks. Earlier, he led design at Globo.com. Felipe's work has been recognized by the UX Awards, I by DA, Interaction Awards, uh, Red Dot Design Awards, Webby Awards, Clio, Cons, Lions, and London Awards. He is a member of the IADAS and has served as a judge in several industry competitions, including the One Show Interactive. He's also the author of Design Para on Internet, a best selling book about UX published in Brazil. Felipe holds a BS in design and a MS in ergonomics and HCI from Puerto Rico, where he is also has taught before moving to the US. Felipe is a designer who keeps one foot firmly planted in the history and traditions of modernism and one raised in forward stride, keeping pace with the latest developments in technology and its thoughtful integration into society by design. Please join me in a big virtual welcome for a remarkable individual who truly carries the Vignelli legacy into our present and into our future, Felipe Memoria. Well, thank you, Josh. What, a, what an introduction. Um, yeah, it's a very special day for me. I'm very happy uh, to be here. Um, and thanks everybody for joining. I know, uh, you know, it's yet another Zoom call during this pandemic that we're having, so it's not easy. Um, so I really appreciate everybody uh, joining today. I'll share my screen to uh, talk about the project. Uh, by the way, this is the picture you were referencing, Josh. Uh, it's really, really unbelievable. I was so happy uh, to get your email that day because obviously, um, you know, everything we did in this project had so much to do and was so inspired uh, by the work that Massimo did with the Unimark team uh, back then. And, uh, you know, getting uh, to have the opportunity to be with you all here, it's really a dream come true for not only for me, but for the entire working code team that worked in the project. It's the best possible uh, compliment we could get. So. Really, really, I think it's very common that, you know, in situations like this, the speaker says, I'm honored to be here. But in this case, there's no better word to say, you know, how, how I feel. It's really an honor to be here today. Uh, yeah, and this is my, my kid. Um, we, we visited in 2014. Um, it, it was a very special moment for me. It was great. And uh, I look forward to, to visiting you all uh, when this is all over uh, again. So, Let's get to the, to the project we're here to talk about, uh, the, the subway map, the live subway map that we did for, for New York City um, and launched uh, very recently. Uh, I'll give you some context. You talked a lot about, uh, about my experience and, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about Working Co because Working Co is really the company, the platform that allowed us to do this amazing work uh, pro bono. So we started the company and one of the founders uh, in 2013 and we really wanted to create a company that was focused in, in one thing and one thing only, which, it, which is uh, digital products. Um, I think a lot of the companies in our space are, are companies that are uh, so, sort of full service agencies. And we decided to focus in one thing uh, and, and try to be really good at that. And uh, it's interesting, you know, talking about uh, Vignelli and, and his experience, uh, Unimark comes to mind uh, as, as a model for that type of uh, business that we decided to create and as an experiment back then. Um, and, you know, in a way, it's kind of interesting. They, when they started Unimark, they started with uh, a bunch of designers that were very accomplished that could start their own businesses by themselves. And they decided to kind of connect and create this uh, design consultancy that, as we all know, became so important and, and the largest in the world at its time. So it's similar to what we did. Um, we were all in a, in a very interesting and good moment in our careers when we decided to start Working Co. And we also decide, decided to sort of 
take some of the learnings from here and continue to keep our focus on, on design, designing and, and developing and building uh, digital products, uh, as opposed to doing other things like uh, advertising campaigns, marketing, uh, social media. I think that's all great, but um, I think other people do those things better than we do and we try to focus in one thing. So this experiment has been working really well so far. We're about to turn eight. Uh, we're about 400 people. If, if we join here, some some folks that work in companies that we, we eventually acquired, uh, it's 400. We have six offices around the world. Um, Unimark was very successful with that too. So we have offices um, in the US. The, the headquarters is in Brooklyn. And then we have uh, the second largest in the US is in Portland. And then we have in my, uh, Brazil, my home country. Uh, so we have Rio de Janeiro, where I, I'm, I was born and raised, and Sao Paulo. And in Europe, we're in Copenhagen and Serbia. And uh, again, we're really focused in shipping things. So we try to design things that will see the light of the day. And we like to put things uh, in the hands of people. Um, and I think that's, that's really meaningful and important for designers. So we really like to design and, and, and build things. And I think the, the MTA uh, project that we did is a good representation of that. So that combination of these three very important disciplines, which are basically the only disciplines we have, uh, and that combination of design and technology is it, really crucial uh, for uh, the level of detail that us as uh, designers that are absolutely obsessed about quality uh, like to sort of pay uh, too much attention to. Uh, we were fortunate to have had the chance to work with very large, important clients. So, um, you know, uh, it's amazing to work with all these folks. Uh, there's companies that are uh, sort of grew up digital and started in the digital uh, times we're living in. And there's companies that are going through digital transformation. Um, we also work with some startups, uh, but um, anyways. So enough of that. I don't want to bore you with more work and code, but I think it's important to give some context on why we were fortunate to be able to do this uh, gigantic project uh, for the city of New York, um, completely pro bono. So let's talk about the project now, um, the fun part of the presentation. So just talking about maps for a second, uh, I think it's safe to say that we're all very familiar with this map. It's been around for about 40 years. Um, and the interesting thing about this map the, that it's you know, known as the Hertz map regardless of the point of view and the design of it, it is actually that it's a printed map. And the problem with printed maps is that they get old very fast and they have to be printed all the time because things are changing all the time. Uh, not only, you know, stations are being built or, or, and the system is evolving, uh, but also specifically in New York, there's a bigger problem, which is, uh, you know, maintenance. Uh, New York is a 24 seven uh, service. So, if you, if you imagine like what, you know, what is the optimal time to do maintenance and to fix things and so forth, uh, you know, I think it's reasonable to agree with their plan of doing it uh, on the weekends and at night. So uh, what happens is that during weekends and at night, there's a lot of changes in the system to accommodate for, for all the maintenance work. And obviously a printed map cannot do a great job at, at signing that, at, at talking about that and communicating that uh, to, to the riders. So the sort of workaround and the thing that happens and New Yorkers are very familiar with that is actually that they have to print those posters to sort of communicate that those maps are actually not accurate, that things are working in a different way, especially on the weekends. Uh, there's a map that actually uh, is available for the service at night that a lot of people are not familiar with that's, that's sort of you know, reasonably consistent, but uh, the change of service due to um, you know, renovations and things like that is, is dramatic on the weekends. It's very tough, very difficult to understand, to read, not really accessible. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a problem, but uh, it's a problem of the medium more than actually the design solution, right? So, so that's the, you know, the, the sort of state of affairs that we are right now. So let's talk a little bit about the history of that project in particular, uh, because it's so important, right? When we got the opportunity to work on it, we knew that we had to do a lot of digging and, uh, and really like honor uh, the, all the work that was done in the past and, and stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So if you, you, know, if you think about and, and, and kind of learn about the history of the maps of, of the New York transit system, 
you would know how it came about. And the way it came about was basically that there's three different independent companies that were digging the city and building the tunnels and so forth. And they were doing their maps independently. Uh, eventually, uh, some maps started to be designed, sort of putting them all together and, and seeing the system as a unified system. Uh, so there's not only those three versions, there's several others. Um, and, but the, the interesting uh, sort of characteristic of all of them is that for, the, for most of the time, they were geographical maps, right? Um, and I think the story starts to become really, really interesting when uh, those two folks and, and you know, uh, the company in general, Unimark, uh, came about to help uh, redesigning the entire system, not only the map, but the entire uh, wayfinding uh, system of the subway. So Bob Nurda on the right, as you guys all know, and uh, Massimo on the left. So Bob was uh, in Italy and he had experience designing uh, the subway for Milan. Uh, one of the stations there. And Massimo was moving from Italy to New York to, to sort of be the design director of the office uh, in the city. And they were introduced by, by, uh, to the MTA and started working on, on the project for redesigning the wayfinding system. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of how the system was at the time. And it's just a consequence of years of you know, growth and kind of merging the, the, the three companies and so forth. And what they did, which is unbelievable and you know fascinating, is simplify it, uh, following obviously the modernist tradition, making it really, really simple, and thinking about this system that could expand uh, towards everything. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things that happen after that. So this is like one of the original uh, designs that they did. The, the the signs were in white. The typeface was still not Helvetica; it was standard. Uh, accidents were tisk. But they were, you know, already thinking about the modularity of it and the circles that became so iconic uh, with the letters and organizing everything in a way that was much more clear. So the difference is really dramatic. Eventually, uh, you might know this, but I think it's super interesting. The, the, the signs were made black because of graffiti and, and, and things like that. They were scared of, of them getting, you know, looking really dirty. And, and that white stripe on top that is so iconic today was also a mistake when they were printing the signs because they, they thought that the, the drawings for the piece that would hold the signs were actually indicating that it should be a line, a white line there. So this evolved a lot and it's not as modular a, as it was supposed to be, but the system evolved with time to become the iconic system that, that we know today. So it was a great step towards that direction. Uh, so this was a gigantic product, as you know. Um, one of the things that, that I thought was interesting too, to kind of uh, you know, learn when they were researching a lot about the project was the participation of Joe and Cherison. So she uh, actually collaborated with Massimo who was leading uh, the graphic design for the, the, the first version of the, uh, the diagram, right? Or, or the map, uh, but at the time, uh, you know, he decided to do a diagram. Uh, that, that story of the diagram is super, super interesting. So. They came up with, with that, as you know, which we all love, uh, inspired by the work done by, by Harry Beck in London. Um, and Harry Beck's another fascinating character that you know, we could talk a lot about. Uh, but what I think is super interesting that a lot of people don't talk about in, when they, they kind of discuss the history of that project was that Unimark actually uh, designed, like suggested that the system had to have three different sort of maps, right? So one would be the diagram and the diagram has one main job, which is telling you how to go from point A to point B. And that's kind of all it does, you know, again, thinking about simplicity and focusing on the thing that matters the most, that's a great way to represent that. But together with that, they thought that, you know, it should have a complementary geographic map because it is really important as we know today to know uh, if the place you want to go is actually close to the station you think you should you should go, right? So that combination and that sort of relationship is really important. So the geographic part of it is important. And then there was a neighborhoods map too that was interesting for tourists. And it, it's, a, it's a map that is supposed to tell you once you're at the station, what's interesting, what, what are the interesting things happening here around the station, right? So it's great for discovery. So that's what they kind of specified when they were doing the whole uh, system for, for the wayfinding. 
But as it turns out, uh, they were only commissioned to do the diagram. And so that's what they did. They did the diagram and it was printed and launched and, and stay there for seven years. Um, and seven years later, um, what happened was that uh, this other folks came about. So on the left side, we have uh, John Taranak and on the right side, we have the team of uh, Michael Hertz Associates. Michael Hertz is the one in the bottom, the third from left to right. And Michael Hertz and his team, they were already updating the, the diagram because like I was saying in the beginning, those maps, uh, they have to be updated constantly. So they were already working on that. They were, I think, in some sort of retainer with the MTA doing that work. And John Taranak uh, was working at the MTA and he was uh, sort of, you know, of the opinion that the map should be uh, geographical and not really a diagram. And he, he managed to sort of justify and, and uh, you know, come up with a good case to switch the diagram to, to a different point of view uh, and, and a different design in collaboration with the Michael Hertz team. So after seven years, uh, they launched this uh, map that is still the base of the map that exists today uh, from, from 79. So it's the Michael Hertz map. And you know, it's, it's very similar if you think about it from a logic perspective like it's geographical and the other big change is they have the trunk lines, right? So they managed to actually find a budget at the time to change the wayfinding. So they could actually simplify and have the lines combined. Uh, so, so this map could have more information but still be a little simpler than uh, the solution uh, that, that Pinelli uh, designed for, for the diagram. Which we're, gonna, we're gonna talk more about that later on. Uh, but anyways, this evolved to, to this map that we have today. The colors changed a little bit. They added more information. Uh, the ferries are there, for example, and so forth. So forth, and it has been there for a long time. Um, what happened after this entire sort of change was that New York today uh, is one of the very, very few uh, large cities in the world that don't have a diagram as the main uh, sort of way to communicate the system. So, uh, you know, it kind of because of that controversy, it stayed like that. And, and as you guys know, too, there were debates about it. Tarnak and Vignelli had uh, discussions and it's, I think, the most heated debate probably in the, in the, the, the New York graphic design uh, scene. Uh, There's a debate about the two maps. So uh, in 2008, Men's Vogue um, talked to Massimo about sort of revising his design for, for the diagram. And he thought it was super interesting to do that. He got to do that. So he designed the second version uh, of, the, of the diagram, the one on the right. And here it was super interesting. I think it's fascinating because he, he was taking some of the feedback that he got from, from back then, right? And, and kind of addressing some of them, but at the same time being kind of bold about other, other decisions he made. So the water, for example, that some people, Tarnak, uh, like to say that, oh my God, the water should be white, uh, should be, sorry, should be blue, uh, you know, and not sort of muddy, uh, you know, they changed, Vienna changed to blue. Uh, and in other ways, like uh, the, you know, Manhattan uh, uh, Central Park being square, you know, Vignelli was a little bolder about his statement and, you know, and like, well, you know what, this is not supposed to actually reflect uh, the geography, so I'm just going to take it off completely um, and, and be even more pure about it, right? Um, so there's a lot of interesting things, and one of the biggest allies of the new version that Massimo worked on was actually the color. So uh, I think it's one of the main differences between the right and the left is actually the colors for the lines themselves. So he could here actually import the colors that I was talking about from the first version of the Hertz map uh, that was kind of, you know, redrawn and, and kind of worked together because they changed the wayfinding itself. So he could actually get that and make the map even more useful. So anyways, that's the story. So they were doing that for Men's Vogue and then the MTA internally, they were working on a website to actually start communicating the change of service that you know I talked about at the beginning and that, that is represented by, by posters, right? And put all that content on the internet. And they started to redesign the, the diagram to kind of communicate that because it's appropriate for, for that type of information. And eventually they learned that Vignelli had done that for, uh, for Men's Vogue and then they got in touch and he donated the, the work for, for the MTA to be used on the Weekender. 
And it, as far as I know, it's, I think it's the only website that, that Massimo got to work on. Um, correct me if I'm wrong later, uh, Josh and, and team, but uh, I think it's the only website that he ever worked on. And um, so because of that, today we have actually the two maps uh, active, right? So, you know, the one on the right is, is it's the default in a way, it's used everywhere. And the weekender has the diagram and, and, and is active. Um, our project was actually called the Weekender 2.0 when the MTA uh, started talking to us because they wanted to make it a little more dynamic and a little more modern and, and revisit that, right? So uh, that's when it came, uh, we came about to kind of rethink uh, th that solution, think about the map and think about what it could do uh, that would make sense for today. And, um, and I have to, to share like the first instinct, right? Because we started the project and, you know, being a minimalist and, and trying to reduce everything, uh, my, my first instinct in the team was like, you know what, like, why do we even need a map? Why do we just, uh, why don't we just tell you what's the closest station to you? And, you know, this beautiful iconic circle and uh, there's a clock around, which is a pattern that we've seen before with, you know, the time frame for the next train and you enter your destination and, and off you go. You don't need a map and perhaps you just like type where you're going and then you just have a straight line, like a very, very, very minimal version of the diagram in a way, in a straight line. And that would be so easy to build and that's it. And you know, we were very excited about that. So we went to the first meeting of the MTA to show this and some other concepts. This is just the one that I think illustrates really well where we were going with this in the beginning. And, and it was interesting because the MTA came back to us like, look, this is beautiful, we love it, but you know, this is not the brief, we need a map. Uh, people really, really like the map. Um, regardless of what we build, eventually the map becomes the most popular feature. And uh, the other thing is like, you know, New Yorkers don't really wanna be told how to get to places like the way you did here. Uh, I think there's something about, about New Yorkers that they're really proud of really learning uh, and knowing the system. And, you know, they don't want to be told how to, how to get from, from A to B. They, they, they want to decide for themselves. So I thought it was really funny being in New York for 14 years. I was like, okay, I get it. I, I, I understand. And so we needed to really design the map and come back to that sort of debate and have a point of view about how to make a map that would... Um, make sense to the times we're living in, uh, but also respect the legacy and, and get the learnings from, from you know, the great masters that, that worked on it. So here's our solution. Uh, everything became kind of simpler and easier once we decided to set two principles. And I think it's very important in design to have those sort of set in stone ideas um, and to give you some sort of sort of guardrails to uh, to continue the project, so it's not super open, right? So there are two things that we thought were non-negotiables. The first one is that to show change of service, which is the entire point of the map, you must use a diagram's multiple tracks approach. So comparing the two uh, solutions, the two points of view, uh, the one thing that everybody talks about is one being geographical and the one being a diagram. But the second uh, most important difference is actually, again, the way the lines are, are drawn here, right? So on, on the trunk lines on the right side, the A, C, and E are all together. And on the diagram, they're independent, right? And if you wanna do a product that by definition is flexible enough to change routes and to show that some lines are not working uh, and others are, um, you absolutely need one line per train. So that was something that for us was, you know, set in stone and okay, it has to be that paradigm uh, from, from that perspective, right? And, and the second one is, you know, in today's world, we need location uh, precision. So that blue dot that our phones are capable uh, of, of showing to us where we are is really crucial. Every great product we use that is a map-based product has that as a feature. And, and you kind of just expect that. If you, if you did anything that didn't have that, would be uh, you know, a missed opportunity and not really up to the standards that everybody's used to today. So you know, obviously, 
that's the you know one of the main reasons why uh, this could not be done in the past is like you can't really put a blue dot in the in the diagram. It, this just wouldn't work. And the diagram, by definition, in, in such a small space uh, for for you know a printing uh, material. Uh, you couldn't actually make it map, and because of the geometrical qualities of it, you couldn't map to 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 the geography. So, how do you do that, right? We couldn't just get the diagram and put it there because the blue dot would be a problem. So after a while, we kind of, you know, thinking about that, how how do we make that work? How do we get the qualities from both? Because the, ge the geography is really important, and I think we know that today. Um, how do we do that? And then eventually, we came to the to the conclusion that actually. You know, if you zoom in, if you zoom enough, it works. That sort of problem of matching the geometry with the geography uh, goes away if you have a canvas that is that small. If you zoom very much, right? So uh, you can. The problem is when you start zooming out. But when you're in that sort of focus, uh, it's fine, and you can then have the blue dot there uh, that indicates in a precise way where you are. So we have kind of the best of both worlds combined here. So the multiple tracks and the geography working with the, the geometry. And, you know, the other thing that we thought was a great opportunity was to, you know, why not make the trains move, right? It's a powerful screen we have. It's like you can play videos. It's so, you know, it's so fun and, and interactive. And, and I think that doing the, the trains would be, you know, we thought was, would be amazing, not only because, it, you know, it delights people, but also communicates what the map does, uh, which is basically being live and changing uh, depending on what's going on in the system, is the truth of the system, right? Um, so that was something that was really difficult to build and we were really excited about. And I think it, it made a big difference because it really kind of brings that joy, but also communicates. So thinking about, you know, zooming out. So we had the solution for zooming in. So, so how do we do when you zoom out? So the idea was that, well, when you zoom out, you keep the map because, you know, it's, you want to keep the geography uh, and that blue dot. But what you could do is actually make the curves that were very geometric become a little more organic, like nature, right? There's no straight lines in nature. So the organic, organic lines that kind of match the, the, the sort of randomness of, of, of the earth um, and, uh, and nature. So, so if you notice, very few people actually notice, you have to be a, a detail-oriented designer to actually in play already, play, play a lot of it to actually notice, but the lines, they actually change a little bit the curve uh, to actually adapt and, and, uh, and kind of you know, look, nice, look, look nicely in the, you know, with, the, with the map in the background. So that was another thing that I thought was really exciting. Um, so here's uh, how it actually got to work when you were playing with it. So zooming in, of course, with the uh, digital map, you can make a lot of choices about when, you know, what to show when. Uh, so we, we did a lot of work on planning what information to show at what time, you know, obviously station names are more important than some streets and, you know, when you show the parks, when you show all that. So. Um, I think that helped a lot as well on, on cleaning up as much as we could uh, to make sure that the, the information that mattered the most, which is basically the tracks, uh, you know, it's a, it's a train first map, right? Uh, this was in the, the proper hierarchy that had to exist uh, for a map like this. Um, and then, oh, we're having some technical issues here, but anyways, so this is something that I thought was is interesting to show too. Um, you know, there, there's information that is covered by the tracks. We wanted to make the tracks very large and visible and clear. And that naturally sort of hides uh, important information sometimes. So like the trains, uh, the, the stations, exits uh, and entrances that we really wanted to have in the map. It's something that none of the two maps actually have because it would be just too much information, too much clutter. Uh, but here we decided to add them. So if you, you know, pinch a little more, force a little bit, the tracks become transparent and you can see what's in the background, what's in the, in the map and, and uh, the entrances and exits too. Uh, all right, so here's um, just continuing talking about that. Um, the, the service changes are, are the biggest deal of all, right? And I think it doesn't get a lot of the proper attention. A lot of people don't understand uh, what what happens here. So this is the biggest deal of the project and, and the thing that was, you know, the hardest to build. 
And I think here we're moving from now to tonight and weekend. Uh, tonight, uh, when, when it's night, the map, the map gets dark, just like a, you know, a GPS in our car. And I think it's kind of interesting to, to show that you know, as well, communicate the map is live. Um, but the interesting here, thing here, if you notice, if you start paying attention to the tracks, is how it really the tracks change uh, from now to night and the weekend. Um, and you see you know, the A train, for example, becoming disabled, in this case, the C train. And, and things moving and going through different uh, tracks and so forth. So that's what the map really does, but it does in real time. Right here, we have a, a way to predict. You can plan your trip ahead and do that. But uh, the cool thing is that the map is doing that uh, uh, you know, live uh, at the moment in real time. Uh, the other thing that we added that I, that I was happy about was this new pattern of the dash. Um, and the other thing that happens when you have the dash is that the circles become triangles. So this is to communicate that the trains are going to just a specific, uh, just uptown, for example, or, or in another case, just downtown. It's not going uptown and downtown. And that happens uh, with certain frequency. And the diagram and in the map, you can see this information is in general written like in small type on the top, right? So I think a lot of what we try to do here is actually get rid of all that small, small type uh, and, and all those edge cases and actually represent everything in the map itself. So you will look at it and you're see, seeing the truth and the information, uh, you're visualizing the information, you don't need to read anything to understand it. So, so the dash one is, is something that, you know, was, was something that we could build. Um, I think ideally, to be honest, like I would love this to be getting to that direction, be even more clear, but that was so much harder to build that we, uh, we thought that this was uh, a good enough solution for now. Um, we also added the the uh, tunnels uh, from one station to the other, that is something that uh, I think is really useful. So this is the really like the, the biggest deal, right, uh, for the map. And this is why the map is, is a superior solution is because it's changing all the time. It's telling you the truth and therefore you don't need to print anything else uh, to explain uh, to people how, how things are working on right now or trying to understand what people are saying in the trains. Uh, it's just there, it's right there in front of you. Um, another thing that we try to do was uh, simplify the map for people that, that really want, uh, you know, to focus in specific lines they care more about, like if they, you know, they commute in a specific line. So I, I drew inspiration from this cover uh, from, from the diagram. I think this is the second version of the diagram. It was not Massimo's favorite. His favorite was the one that he actually highlighted uh, the diagram a little bit. But I thought this was really cool. And to me, it really looked like something that I could tap on, you know, um, and like buttons or something. So. For, for uh, the phone version of the, of the map, we, we, have, we have it coming from the bottom, like a, like a visual keyboard, like a inspired on the emoji keyboard. It's a combination between an emoji keyboard and this cover. Uh, and on the desktop, it stays on the left side. So basically you can tap in, in, in any of the lines here and, and sort of filter the map for that line, right? So it not only shows that line and kind of grays out everything, you can focus on it. The station, station names become bigger we highlight more uh, the, the sort of other lines that pass through that station so you know uh, that you can uh, switch trains from there. And also we highlighted all the, the tunnels that tell you that you can actually transfer from free from this place to another. So it's really, really useful. And also on the left side, whenever something's happening, um, we, we kind of describe in text as well. So you not only have the, the information visually communicated in the map, but you can also read it and, and understand what's going on on the left side. Um, and you know, another great opportunity was to think about uh, you know the, a version of the map that could make it more clear uh, stations that have uh, ramps and elevators. So we have this button on the on the bottom right side. So if you tap on it, it basically highlights uh, the stations that have uh, ramps and elevators and, and sort of grays out the others that don't. Uh, we decided to keep them there because they're still important for reference. If you're, you know, riding there, uh, you don't, you, you want to have the reference of how many stations you still have to your destination. So it's there, but it just highlighted and make it a little easier to understand and to see and to read. Uh, and then uh, last but not least on, on some of the features and things we built, uh, the station page is really important, right? So this map, just like any other map, you can tap on things to get more details. So the station page is really important. The moving trains, they're, they're, they're fun, 
and they communicate, but they're not that precise, right? So when you tap in one of the stations, you get the drawer. Um, in the first uh, part of the drawer, we actually tell you, I tell users the, you know, uh, the, the, what's going on right now with the elevators and so forth, because there's also maintenance going on and sometimes they're not working. So you have that as the status for that. And then if you scroll down, it's a super simple list um, with, you know, more precise information about the trains are coming and, and how long they're going to take to be there. Um, so, so just finishing up the presentation, um, the, the other interesting thing about the map is that it's a web product, it's a web application. And, and the reason for that is that I think, you know, the web is a very democratic medium. Uh, so the good news is that regardless of the phone uh, that you have, it, it just works well. You open the browser, you type the URL and you get it. Uh, the other good thing about it is that it becomes very flexible for the MTA to use in different contexts. So, you know, you can see them using the map, for example, in the My MTA app and just plugging it there, right? Or you can see in the future them using at the stations, you know, on the big screens. So it's a solution that is really flexible. Uh, you can see on the desktop and the phone. Um, I think the phone is the optimal experience, really optimized for that because our assumption is that uh, most people are gonna use it on the go. Um, and if you actually add to your home screen uh, in your phone, it really behaves like an app. It really works just like an app. So, so that's, that's, uh, those are the reasons why I decided to go with that. And uh, just an update firsthand that I wanted to show to you all, uh, which is really exciting. Um, as you know, as, I'm not sure if you know this, probably not, but like, uh, you know, we finished the project and now it's, you know, MTA's property and they are updating everything and they are, they're, you know, doing the maintenance and they will do lots of obviously enhancements in the map. This is the first version student beta, but they came up with this idea that I really loved and we decided to engage again with them uh, to do an update for, for COVID. So um, hopefully going live uh, in a few weeks, we're going to add this button on the right side that is the, the vaccine button. So it works just like the, the wheelchair. Uh, you tap there uh, and then you, 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 you maps and shows in the map all the spots you can go, um, uh, you know, take a shot. Uh, and if you tap in one of them, you get more details on the left. So it's really useful, really cool. Uh, I can't wait for this to, to go live. Uh, and I can't wait for, for us all to be vaccinated and for this to be over. So just uh, another thing that I thought was really interesting. So that's what I had. Um, I really encourage you guys to um, try the map and play with it. Um, I, I love to play with it. I think it's fun. Um, go to map.mta.info. Um, Josh mentioned uh, Gary's uh, film. I really recommend you to also uh, take a look at the film. He obviously does a much better job than, than I do in, in telling the story. Um, and excited to have a conversation with you all and answer questions. Thank you so much, Felipe. Um, that was wonderful and uh, fascinating, fascinating story. Uh, I, I would disagree. I think you're, you're a very good storyteller. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to go straight to the Q&A um, and, and give our audience an opportunity to uh, chime in. So I'm sure that we will have some questions. So bear with me while I move to that platform and start to pull them in. Well, rather than have dead air <laughs> um, while we're while we're queuing them up here, uh, Felipe, um, I'm just uh, curious to know. Um, you know, you, you talked a lot about um, having studied the Vignelli's um, impact on the early project and uh, the development of um, their work for the MTA. Um, how uh, have you um, have you heard from from people who have followed the Vignelli's work um, reactions to uh, the um, the inspiration that you you took from from them for this um, a little bit a little bit right um, um, I was so excited today to see that uh, that Luca Vignelli uh, commented on 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 the post about this talk it made my day I was so happy um, we saw um, some some nice notes here and there um, I think talking to Michael Beirut was also uh, 
super interesting and, and good to hear from him, a person that worked with Massimo for such a long time. Um, and um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, in general, one thing that I noticed uh, is that people that are into design, um, they, I think they really appreciated the map. Uh, and, and I think it's not very hard to uh, agree that it's a great step ahead uh, it's obviously something that can evolve, you know, I think the, there's so many ways this can evolve. It's the first, it's a first version. Um, but I think what I noticed in general is that the more sophisticated uh, the designers, the more they, they appreciated and they saw, um, the way you saw, uh, the, I think the, the way we looked at it with a lot of respect and, and really building on top of, of a framework that was thought before and using as an inspiration, trying to respect it as much as we could and trying to get the great things from it and try to evolve to, to the different medium. Because I think in the end of the day, that's the biggest difference, right? It's a different discussion because it's a completely different medium. A lot of the things that we did were not possible before just because of the limitations of being a, you know, a material that has to be printed. So, so that's what I, what I heard in general. Um, and, and I think the feedback has been uh, really, really amazing. Uh, Great. So uh, the team is getting the, the uh, questions queued up here and I have a few that are starting to coast in. Um, one is uh, since the, world runs on smartphones these days, do you see a time when the printed map will become completely obsolete? I think so, right? Um, I don't know when, but I think we can um, make a safe bet that they will. Um, one of the things that I realized uh, during this project, more to the end of the project, is how, if you think about it, even the wayfinding, uh, my, you know, altogether, not only the map itself, the printed map, but the wayfinding is kind of obsolete, right? Uh, if you think, especially in New York, where things change all the time. So imagine you're getting to York Street Station in Dumbo, where uh, Working Code is, and only the F train goes there. Mm. But it's very common uh, during the weekend that the A train is actually going there, and the F train is not running at all. So what should happen on the weekend is that the wayfinding should actually drink from the same data we're drinking and actually show that it's the A train today that is coming here. The entire wayfinding should actually be digital and tell you that the A train is running here, right? Um, and, and I think the, the map is part of that bigger system, right? Uh, that we should also say the same thing. So the map is already saying it is much easier. It's a digital, you know, uh, product we did, but if you think about it, the entire wayfinding should be uh, sort of making the same, uh, communicating the same thing and, and, and sort of using the same logic, right? So I think uh, for sure, the problem with New York is that, as you all know, the, the system is very old, it's 100 years old and, and there's limitations around uh, even, you know, simple things like power. And, and there's also you know, things that we have to worry about as far as vandalism. You know, there's things that we don't even think about. People break screens, like I can't imagine, but they do break screens. Um, so I think one day it will happen. I'm not sure when, but it's, I think it's inevitable, right? It's something that is like uh, up for, for disruption. Uh, next question is, you obviously have influence from the Vignales, which is wonderful. But do you have any other favorite designers, sources for inspiration, or resources that have helped you develop your your own design philosophy and the firm? Oh my God, uh, so many! I mean, <laughs> I can name I can name them all. I mean, I have I have um, uh, I come from a family of architects. Um, it's four generations, um, and uh, so I was brainwashed uh, since I was very little. And, and influenced dramatically by my mom, my dad, and, and you know, my, even my brother as, as an architect. I'm the only person in my, in my family uh, that, that decided to do graphic design as opposed to architecture. So obviously architecture is a great, it plays a big, big role in, in my uh, sort of the way I, I, I see my work and my influences. And I think it's similar to, to the Vignelli's and, and uh, you know, it's, it's actually the sort of the mother 
of all the creative disciplines, right? Um, and so architecture is a big, uh, big deal for me. I have a thousand books about, you know, amazing architects. I love Tadawando's work. I love Mi's work, for example, just to talk about two, but obviously I'm very influenced by Brazilian designers. Uh, and then, you know, from furniture, from furniture perspective, uh, I obviously love the work from the Eames, but I also am also very inspired by, by work done in Brazil by this designer called uh, Joaquim Tenreiro. Uh, my family uh, had a collection of his pieces and I grew up around his pieces and uh, I think he's a, an amazing genius. Um, you know, anyways, we, we could talk forever about all those references. I have obviously my preferences in every sort of discipline of, of design. Um, and we could talk all day, like I love it. Uh, but I, I was talking about Massimo and Lila because I think uh, what I love about their work, I think is the, the, the consistency and the rigor that they apply to everything. They, they, they had a language and, and the beliefs and they were so pure about them. And uh, the other thing that I really love is, and I think in that sense, they, they probably win uh, compared to so many other references I have, which is the body of work uh, and the consistency of the body of work. So in other words, like, I think I like more things from them percentage wise, if you think about all the body of work, than, than uh, a lot of other uh, designers that I look up to. Um, of course, you, you learn uh, from different people when you try to take the best of all of them. Um, but I, I think Massimo and Lila are fantastic and so consistent and, and brilliant. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why I, I, I like to, you know, I, I studied a lot about them and I visited and everything. But uh, obviously as designers, we were influenced by, by many, many masters from the past. I think this is an interesting process question that just came in. Um, how long did the entire project take and how much of that I was ideation, discussion, exploration as opposed to design development? So it was a total of 18 months and the ideation and the sort of design only phase was much shorter, it was, it was like, I think two months. Um, and, or less, uh, it, was, it was fast. Um, the, the interesting thing is that we, we kind of took, the solution seems very obvious, but it took a while to get there. Only in the very last meeting, we actually nailed it. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the longer part of the project was actually development. And I think one thing that happened in this project uh, on the development part that I thought was super uh, interesting and in a way kind of different than, uh, than most things we would do is that we decided to approach it in a way uh, the developers call the walking skeleton. Mm. So the walking skeleton is like this unfinished thing that is walking around and you're just looking at it and playing with it and, you know, talking to it. And so, so you were seeing versions of the map uh, constantly and sort of like Michelangelo, like, you know, hammering it and, uh, and shaping it with time and getting annoyed by details that were not right and talking to the developers and they'll come back and and having new ideas and using every day and playing with it. And so that process, you know, was, was much longer, but it was interesting because if you think about uh, the other maps that were done, in general, the other versions of the maps, they took like three years to design, right? We didn't, it didn't make sense for us to actually design everything. We had to design and develop at the same time because we have so many zoom levels. Imagine the amount of screens you would have to do. It would take years and years and years, right? So uh, the smart thing to do was actually to build as we were designing. So once we had the idea, the main ideas that I shared today, I think the, the, the next step would be to validate them because we didn't know if they were actually gonna work. We had the idea, it was like, oh, can we do that? Can we make the curves change? Can we actually make it work in a smaller canvas and and and, and would it work in a, in a bigger canvas when you zoom out? All of those things are being played with and, and tested. And there were always like surprises, you know, like, oh my God, this can be done or, or this can be done. There was a, there's a story that I love, which is the, the rotation of the, of the map. So we were using Google Maps in the beginning and, and Google invests a lot of time on the apps, uh, but not necessarily as much time. It's not a priority for them, the mobile web for the phone, right? So you can't, if you use their, their, their product, 
you can't actually rotate the city, Manhattan, to be 90 degrees. Manhattan's kind of 45 like this. And I remember, you know, one day the developers came to me and said, Felipe, we have bad news. So <laughs> we can't rotate Manhattan. It can't be 90 degrees. And, I'm, and I was like, oh my God, like this destroys everything. Imagine the entire solution is over. <laughs> like it wouldn't work that well. Um, and, and but they were like, well, but we have a solution. We have, uh, you know, other options. Let's think about this, you know, other other options of the map and, and, uh, and use a solution that can actually allow us to rotate the map. So, so this type of thing is super interesting. As, as we were developing, uh, we were finding out those things and, uh, and, and making it better and making it better. And so it's this collaboration between design and development that was really special. And I think you can only do that in a company that your development team is just as strong as your design team. You have to have that sort of uh, collaboration going on. If we, we could never design this and give it to someone else to build ever. Yeah. Well, this actually is a, a good segue. I, I want to try to stitch together two questions coming from two different people here. One is, uh, and both are about d diversity. Uh, one asks uh, how diversity impacts the, the work dynamic at Work & Co and how working with people from different backgrounds influences solutions uh, that you deliver. But I wanna kind of stitch that to another question, which is um, how did you try to ensure that you were designing with consideration for many different audiences, edge cases, considering how many different people that your project would impact in New York? So sort of a broader look at, at diversity in your company and, and how it impacted uh, the, the overall story and approach to design. Sure. So, so we're, uh, you know, we work with clients and, and uh, I showed the, you know, some of the, the companies you work with. So we, we work in general uh, with products of the, you know, all sorts of different uh, sort of target publics. Right. And, um, and I think it's important as a designer for you to identify uh, and, and be kind of a customer or a user of that company or that product, right? Um, so I think it, it, one of the things that I that I love about being in, in the business I am of, of uh, and you know most of us designers is of working with different clients all the time is that uh, you have that variety and we, what we try to do is always try to cast the team that is going to work on those projects in a way that represents the customers. Uh, and the people that care about those companies and use their products, right? So it's very important uh, from a diversity perspective to always make that make sense, right? So in a smaller sense, for example, for the MCA project, uh, we are a global company, but we knew that only the New York based designers could work on it because we are the ones that take the subway on a daily basis, right? So I think it's really important uh, for, for us as designers to sort of have skin in the game and feel the pain and, and use the product, use the service. And, and if you love it, uh, the best case scenario is that you can design for yourself a little more. I think it's something that is like controversial to say sometimes in, in design, but it's like, if you are a customer and if you love this product, you can kind of, you are the user. When you are the user, everything is simpler. And I think it's a good connection to, to the second question, uh, which is, having the, the sort of different audiences and edge cases and so forth. The interesting thing about the subway is that it's the, the wider audience we've ever had. Because even if you think about uh, Apple, who, Apple was our biggest client for a very long time. It's still like a, you know, a small, very small percentage of, you know, wealthier part of society that buy Apple, Apple products, right? Uh, the subway, no, for the MTA, it's like, it's everybody. It's the most democratic, you know, uh, product I think I've ever worked on. It's really like the, the target public is everybody, everybody from all ages, all backgrounds, uh, and in New York, like the melting pot, you know, referencing the famous uh, poster uh, by the Vignellis. Um, so I think in that sense, we try to, you know, uh, have uh, people with different backgrounds working on it, uh, people that were immigrants like myself and, you know, from, you know, all sorts of different uh, possible representations, people that have been in New York for a very long time, people that, that uh, came to New York and, and suffered trying to understand uh, all the communications and everything. Uh, and also talk a lot with the MTA folks because they 
feel the pain. And, and it, it's, it's interesting how people have a love and hate relationship with the subway. And they get a lot of heat all the time. Uh, our main client, Sarah Myers, the chief customer officer for, for the city, and she's very aware of the pain points. All the folks at MTA are so aware of, of the priorities and what people care about. So I think that tight collaboration with them was really helpful. And then just to finish up that, that question, I think the other thing is like, you know, you can't sometimes, it's such a complex product that, you know, really to know and learn and continue to evolve, you have to just put it out there, right? So I think the idea is just to, we decided to put it out there because you can, you know, have confidence until a certain point of things you designed and, and hear from people what they're, what they're thinking, get their feedback, right? So we added a, a send feedback link uh, on the map itself uh, we hear people on Twitter, um, and it was great to see after the launch, like the, uh, we organized already all the feedback, everything we heard um, uh, to, to eventually evolve the product and tackle things and so forth. The good news is that we were so obsessed about it. I was so obsessed about it. It felt like, uh, like uh, the Queen's Gambit series on Netflix, you know, like when she was like looking at the ceiling uh, before going to sleep and just thinking about it all the time. That's how I felt. I was completely obsessed about it for such a long time. And the team as well, everybody was so passionate about it that we actually mapped all the things. Uh, so I would say that like, you know, 95 or more percent of the things we heard were things that we, we were aware of and we want to evolve later. In digital products, that's what you do. You make some prioritizations and in design projects in general, it's the same thing with architecture. And so, you know, in pretty much every profession, uh, you, you make some prioritizations and you, you launch something that you're proud of that you think is pretty good, but nothing is perfect. You can always tweak it and, and continue to make it better. So I think it's going to be interesting to evolve it and, 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 and hear people and get their feedback to take it to a, to a different level. Mm. Well, that we're, we're, um, we're, reaching the end of our time, but I do want to ask one more question and, and I'm doing my best because there are many questions coming in uh, to uh, attack similar questions and, and put them together. So there are quite a number of questions that are, are addressing future generations uh, of your uh, design. Uh, there are questions about uh, whether this is in the planning for other cities. Uh, you know, are you discussing other um, ways to implement uh, this system um, beyond the, the present iteration? Yeah, no, I mean, um, I would love to. Uh, that was my plan, actually. My evil plan was to design for New York and eventually uh, make it a, a solution that can be used by, by the entire world. And New York is one of the most complex systems in the world. So when you design for New York, it's easy, it's easy to scale down and make it work for systems that are, that are not as complex. Tokyo is very challenging too, uh, but, but I think it's a, it's a solution that was thought uh, from the beginning to be something uh, that could be eventually uh, used everywhere. So, so for sure. So we, we did talk uh, to some, some cities uh, and, and those conversations have been amazing uh, you know, like it, it's really amazing. It's really great. Um, I, I, I wish I could talk about them better not, as, as you know, but yes, there's that. And then, and then the, you know, the evolution, I think it's very clear. There's so many things you can do with the map. I think there's a lot of, you know, polishments we can make and, uh, you know, like, you know, we're designers. So we're looking at things all the time, like, oh my God, here, you know, it could be a couple of pixels to the left. So there's things like that, that we as designers care more about. Uh, and there's things that writers care more about. Uh, that, that I think are very important too. And, and, and all those things are mapped. I think it's now a matter of, um, you know, seeing uh, availability of, of the team at the MTA and, and even at Working Co. eventually we can, you know, hopefully work on it sometimes. Uh, we just can't work on it forever. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I wish we could, um, but, but the MTA has amazing developers. I met all of them when they were uh, starting the project and they're all obsessed about the subject. They love it and uh, really mission driven. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're always in touch and, and it's natural that it's going to get better with time. They've been doing a lot of work already on the back end, things that are not so visible to people. You know, there's things like performance and, and how the data is accurate and things like that that have to be done too. So they've been doing a lot of work on that, on that front. 
And, and I trust that this is just the beginning, that the map is going to become uh, even more powerful and better over time. I'm sure it is. Well, Felipe, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you with us tonight and to engage in this discussion around uh, such an impactful and important project. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I, I want to invite you to uh, stay tuned for our next design uh, conversations lecture, which will be uh, about a month from now. You can visit our website and, uh, and sign up for the next one. So take good care, everyone. And thanks again, Felipe. Good night, all. My pleasure. Bye.